Thank you for joining us. I'm uh, Dr. Dustin Bird, Professor of Philosophy and Religion at the University of Olivet. And today I have joining with me Dr. Rudolph J. Siebert, who is Professor Emeritus at Western Michigan University in the Department of Comparative Religion, he also taught in the Department of Sociology, taught for over 50 years at Western Michigan University. Dr. Siebert is the founder and director of two international courses, one in Dubrovnik, Croatia, the other in Yalta, Ukraine, and the Crimea. He's written over 30 books and hundreds of articles on a variety of issues, including critical theory of religion, Frankfurt School, Hegel, political theology, psychology of religion. Uh, he's the foremost proponent and developer of the critical theory of religion in society, which has been developing for over 50 years. And he recently published a book, Hegel and the Critical Theory of Religion, with Ekperosis Press. He's currently writing a book on the authoritarian personality, and he's a member of the Institute for Critical Social Theory. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Siebert. So today, we're going to talk about Gregory Baum, his life, work, and, and the, your friendship with him. For those of you who aren't familiar with Gregory, I'll give you a little background. Gregory Baum was a theologian, author, and activist. He was born Gerhard Albert Baum in Berlin in 1923, born of a Jewish mother and a Protestant father. Born, uh, Baum was a war refugee arriving in Canada uh, via England in 1940. Like many other Jewish ref refugees, Baum first landed in Quebec, where he would spend much of his life. In 1946, while studying mathematics at McMaster University, a friend gave Gregory a copy of St. Augustine's Confessions, which led him to eventually embrace Catholicism, and he later became a priest. Academically, Gregory Baum was greatly attracted to the study of philosophy, sociology, and theology, which he put to use within the Catholic Church. He was a paratus, a theological advisor during Vatican II for the ecumenical secretariat. Baum drafted an early version of the famous Vatican Declaration, Nostra Aetate, in our time, which sought to reformulate the church's relationship to non-Christian religions, especially Judaism. Having been raised within a Jewish family, having become a Catholic priest, and having studied the long history of Christian antisemitism, Baum was in a unique situation to write such a momentous document. Pope Paul VI promulgated the Declaration in 1965, which called for the cessation of the church's mission to convert the Jews. Auschwitz confirmed to Baum and later the church that it was no longer possible to blame the Jews for the murder of Christ, for the consequence of such an accusation was absolute barbarism. Baum would go on to become a professor of theology and sociology at the University of St. Michael's College in the University of Toronto, and after 1986, he became a professor of theological ethics at McGill University within the Department of Religious Studies. In the 1970s, he became especially interested in liberation theology and the works of the Frankfurt School. He was introduced to the critical theory of religion by our guest today, Dr. Rudolf J. Siebert, whom Baum dedicated his 1994 book, Essays in Critical Theology. While Baum admitted that much of the Frankfurt School's work proved to be impenetrable to him, he nevertheless incorporated the theological potentials of Adorno, Horkheimer, Benjamin, and Fromm, and others into his own theological work. From 1962 to 2004, Baum served as the editor of The Ecumenist, and also served as the editor to the International Catholic Review Concilium, both of which Dr. Siebert contributed many articles over the years. In the year 1990, Baum was made an officer of the Order of Canada in recognition of being a, quote, a guide and inspiration to generations of students of many different faiths and background, unquote. Indeed, Baum was deeply ecumenical, even penning a book entitled The Theology of Tadic Ramadan, A Catholic Perspective, which was published by the University of Notre Dame in 2009. In total, Baum wrote or edited nearly 50 books on a wide variety of subjects, many of which were translated into numerous languages outside of French and English. It is well known that Gregory struggled with his own sexuality. Although he was married to Shirley Flynn until his death on October 18, 2017, 
Gregory was open about his attraction to men, as he recounts in his autobiographical work, The Oil Has Not Run Dry, published in 2016. While some may use Gregory's openness to dismiss his work, it is important to realize that individuals are always bigger than their struggles, and that Baum's honest struggle to embrace who he was remains one of the reasons why we ought to remember him, read him, and continue to develop his work in the 21st century. So my first question for you, Dr. Siebert, is, is an autobiographical one. How, how did you come to know Gregory Baum? Well, we had a young scholar here who uh, taught at Nathos College, and um, he had uh, received his PhD. He did his PhD with Gregory Baum in Toronto, and so I was supposed to take care of him and his family a little bit. They were still very young, and uh, so that's what I did, and uh, through this, I came to Toronto the first time, and I met Gregory Baum in the middle of the 1970s. That was 10 years after the Second Vatican Council, in which he had been an experitus uh, together with Hans Küng and also with uh, uh, Baptist Metz. The, the, all three of them had been advisors to the council, and we were friends all three together. So that is the first time when I met Gregory in, in Toronto. Okay. And, and how did you stay in touch? I mean, he was mainly in, in Canada. I know you taught in Canada, especially when you're early in your career as well. Did you ever meet him in Canada, spend time with him there as well? Yeah. Well, well I um, in this, from the 70s and 80s, I went every summer to Canada and taught one semester there in, uh, in London and in the then in Fredericton later on, so in different universities. And every time when I went up to Canada, I met Gregory Baum too. He always came to the airports and um, we had a good time having discourse with each other. And uh, so that is how the friendship grew through the years. We were very different in a certain way. He came from Berlin, I came from Frankfurt. He came from the um, middle bourgeoisie uh, in Berlin, uh, I came from the working class section in the west side of Frankfurt. So we had a very different background. He was Jewish. I was uh, Aryan, as this was called at that time. But a wonderful friendship developed in spite of all these differences through the years. So I gave a, a brief summary of, of Gregory's life and achievements. Are there other important developments that happened in his life and his biography that, is, that are fundamental to understand, to, to understand his work? So when we met the first time, that is when somehow the crisis in his life uh, developed. Um, he had been for 28 years or so a monk of the Augustinian Aramites. The Augustinian Aramites, that is the order from which Martin Luther King came. And Martin Luther came, not Martin Luther King. So, um, and somehow his life was um, similar to Martin Luther. He entered the order and finally left the order in certain conflict. And the conflict was about five um, new um, sentences which the Vatican had put out about sexuality. And uh, somehow Gregory could not. Uh, agree with these five points, one about masturbation and so on. And um, so they were all about sexuality. And so he could no longer hear confession. That is how it started. And so the next step was, and that all happened then in the 70s when we became friends. And I tried to, um, he wanted to leave the order. So I tried to find him a place in the diocese where he could serve as a priest there, but uh, then he also uh, finally left the priesthood <clears throat> and he did not want to get married, but then a year later, he decided to get married anyway. And um, so since he was a priest and uh, had the celibacy vow, he um, could not marry, of course, until he would be laicized. And, uh, so the um, 
church hesitated to laicize him. Whenever there are people who are famous, then the church has a hard time to laicize because a lot of people are involved who are following this person and now the person is excommunicated. That means something for all of them. So uh, Gregory waited a year for the uh, laicization and it did not come. And so then he simply decided on his own <clears throat> to get married in spite of the fact that he was not laicized and that meant of course automatic excommunication. And he was excommunicated then up to the end. Sometimes the church lifts the excommunication when somebody is on the deathbed, but I don't know what happened. I haven't heard. I know that his friends were with him to the last hour, and but I haven't heard anything about the lifting of the excommunication. So uh, that was the um, background of our relationship. And uh, <clears throat> we soon came to talk about my uh, work with the Frankfurt School. And uh, there was particularly the methodological question here, try to take over the uh, dialectical method of the Frankfurt School, which was called determinate negation, that you negate something, and at the same time, you also preserve something of what you negate. Uh, that he had done that before without being aware of what uh, uh, what he did. So he was very often critical of things. And at the same time, then he preserved some of what he was critical of. And in reality, it had been the method of the church in the terms of the church of the antiquity negated paganism, but at the same time preserved Platonism, different forms of Platonism, which had a great influence on the church fathers and so on. And then also in the Middle Ages, the church uh, still um, negated critically paganism, but accepted Aristotle, particularly through Thomas of Aquinas. <clears throat> but then the unusual thing happened that in modernity, the church did not any longer um, follow this method. The church now negated the Enlightenment, negated the bourgeois Enlightenment, the Marxist Enlightenment, the Freudian Enlightenment, without preserving elements of it. And that brought about a tremendous uh, uh, chaos in a certain sense, which reaches right into our present situation. Because Benedict XVI was the last attempt to negate powerfully modernity in its totality. And so he was not invited any longer in the University of Rome because he had stated that the Inquisition had been right anyway against Galileo, while his predecessor had admitted that the Inquisition may have made any mistakes. Now the Inquisition did not any, make any mistakes, but the fault was all with Galileo. And so um, the, finally the Pope failed. His attempt to return to the Fathers failed, and because of the failure of his total negativity about modernity, he finally had to resign. He did not resign because he was old. Many, many popes were old and didn't resign. But it was the failure of this pure negation without preservation. So then came the council, and the council, Second Vatican Council was an attempt to relate now to modernity as the church had related to antiquity and to the Middle Ages, namely to reject the uh, pagan elements in the modern civilization, but at the same time also to accept uh, things which had where progress was made. And that in the synod of synodality now comes through, particularly in Germany and in France, where the um, church looks at certain issues which modernity has brought up, particularly in the sexual sphere and so on, or in the relationship to homosexuals and so on, and uh, is willing to accept some of these things. Now, part of the church, uh, or of the synod of synodality, is willing to accept that, but the other part not. And unfortunately, the conservative side is particularly here in the United States. 
So it is particularly the American church which would like to go on with the negation of modernity and uh, not see if there was not something which modernity had produced which would be worthwhile for the church to accept. And over this uh, a tremendous conflict has now been opened up, up to recently, the recent trip to Asia of the Pope in, on the plane. He talked about the uh, relationship, for instance, to China. He has opened up the relationship to communist China. The church uh, in the uh, before Second Vatican Council, uh, before the Second World War, um, the church had only relationships with the fascist state states the Lateran Treaty with Italy and the Reichskonkordat with Germany, which is still valid today in, in Germany, but no relationship to the Soviet Union and so on. So that was to be made good in a certain sense. And now the, uh, the church has a relationship to China, which uh, then makes uh, the uh, um, Fox News and also Eternal Word now outrageous about this and um, just a few, few days ago there were again news by Raymond Arroyo, Arroyo who uh, then attacked the Pope because of his China policy but because of uh, other things which are going on in Germany which are going on in France where bishops and laity and that is important um, have voted in some new issues which have to be decided by the Pope in October or next year. And there is the possibility, as it stands now, of a schism. And I personally will be for the Pope, I think. So this um, is the present situation into which uh, Gregory Baum and uh, also Hans Küng and uh, also uh, Baptist Metz, they have somehow prepared this synod of synodality and this attempt to move forward. So the Pope told the American church, go ahead, forget about this past there, go ahead. And so on. But that's what they don't want to do. They don't want to go ahead. They would like to have the old mass and many, many other uh, issues. So um, this is the conflict. If we can get the whole church on the line of the Second Vatican Council, that this will be really realized. <clears throat> So, and it's important that the, those three theologians particularly, and they traveled here in this country, and, but in spite of all their work here, somehow, uh, for some reason, the uh, Catholic Church of America has become the most conservative part of the uh, uh, global church. So that is what we, the method, so it was very important, which we discussed continually, um, the method of determinate negation or uh, dialectics. So, and there was a problem where uh, Hans Kuhn, uh, where Hans Kuhn too, but uh, Gregory Baum had difficulties. Uh, in contrast to Hans Kuhn, Gregory Baum, had no idea about German idealism. So from Kant to Hegel and Schelling and, uh, and uh, others, um, and therefore was not uh, 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 really familiar with the whole uh, issue of uh, dialectics, notion dialectics, as well as factual dialectics, which came from Hegel. So he started with Marx and with Freud, and we had once a big meeting with 600 nuns in South Dakota, and we got in a conflict with each other because he was willing to take all of Freud while I had some reservations. And so he fought uh, um, hard for the uh, continue, uh, complete acceptance of Freud. So um, uh, nevertheless, that was one issue which we discuss all the time, this methodological issue, which is very important. And uh, the other issue was a content issue, and that was the uh, theodicy problem, um, which came up all the time. And even in the last uh, year of his life, uh, my son, um, one of my sons, 
um, uh, contracted cancer and he was a homosexual at the same time. So when that happened and he uh, came to the end of his life, I told uh, Gregory, I said, we have the theodicy problem again. And so then he wrote me this part, which maybe just a few months before his death, where he wrote, I grieve with you over the tragic fate of your son, Steve. I remember him well. In fact, you often spoke to me about him. The faithful presence of his family will be an important source of strength for him. Um, years ago, you wrote that cancer is a culturally produced disease, not created by nature nor divine providence. The air we breathe and the foods we produce, our ways of eating and drinking, the anguish over injustices and unresolved um, social conflicts, all cultural products wounding us and damaging us in the, our immune system. So Gregory himself was a very optimistic or let's say very hopeful type of a person. And he did not really like to talk about the, um, about the theodicy problem. So that is his answer. He points to my own statements, which I had made in, um, in the past in order to rescue the goodness of God. There were theologies in the past in which the goodness of God had been doubted in a certain sense because of the horror and terror, particularly in the world historical process. But Gregory defended the goodness of God and also the freedom of man and saw the source of evil not in God and not in nature, but in the human world, in the decisions which we make. Uh, and uh, so that uh, um, was an important uh, element which we uh, always had in mind when we came together. But one thing uh, 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 was important for this life, one encounter with another scholar, and um, that was the encounter with the panentheism, as this is called. Um, I just have to look up for a moment what uh, scholar he was concerned with. Um, it was the, uh, the, um, Uh, Maurice Blondel. Maurice Blondel was a Frenchman, a French philosopher, and um, so he uh, had developed the a new type of uh, uh, theology, namely pantheistic. Panentheism means all in God or God in all. So it is um, a theology of inness, of immanence. So somehow panentheism is between the between pantheism, like we have it in Taoism and in Hinduism and in Buddhism on one side, and then and theism on the other side, and particularly deism. So instead of emphasizing the transcendence of God, the otherness of God, um, Blondel emphasized the immanence of God in the world and the immanence of the world in God. And that was quite a turn. It uh, had been done also, uh, uh, Rana, uh, who was the teacher of uh, Gregory. He also already had made contact with the Blondel uh, um, panentheism. Uh, but it went further back to Master Eckhart, <clears throat> who had a panentheistic type of a mystical theology and who is still uh, excommunicated up to the day 600 years after his death. He um, was uh, sentenced by the Inquisition and then defended himself and the Inquisition uh, uh, then accepted him again. But then after his death, when he couldn't defend himself anymore, he was attacked again and then was excommunicated. Unfortunately, is still excommunicated up to, to the present. So 
it was a certain uh, um, for the church questionable um, issue. The church emphasizes the, the theism, the transcendence of God. And now um, there was another version to emphasize the imminence of God. And that is where then praxis, theology, and all that comes from. The whole contact with the Hegelian left, um, which theology then made, has something to do with this imminence type of theology. <clears throat> so the, um, the methodological question, determinate negation, and then the theodicy question, and then also the issue of panentheism. Of course, in a certain sense, the imminence of God in the world sharpens further the theodicy problem, the justice of God and the defense of the justice of God in the face of the enormous injustices, <clears throat> not only in the level of the state or the family or civil society, but particularly in the world historical process uh, with the wars and the killings and, uh, and so on. <clears throat> there, there is where the theodicy problem becomes more in, most intense. You <laughs> talk about the imminent theology and, and transcendent theology, and, and it's very interesting to note that the book that Gregory dedicated you is about critical theology. And critical theology obviously has something to do with the dialectical process and, and some kind of dealing with the antagonisms in the world. Um, but why do you think it is that he he dedicated critical theology to you? Is that because you introduced him to the Frankfurt School in, in, in that way of thinking? Yeah, right. So um, so the his attitude toward the Frankfurt School was somehow ambiguous to the very end where he added something to my festschrift there. He thought that I looked at the Frankfurt School through the eyes of Horkheimer's longing for the totally other. He had written a book, The Longing for the Totally Other, in which he showed his religious elements. And Gregory Baum had read several books which were critical of the Frankfurt School. And his riddle was, why, when those people were so critical of the Frankfurt School, why I was so much for it and represented it throughout from the 60s to now in the United States. So, um, so this, uh, uh, up to the end, he could not resolve that, uh, that problem. So, but I think the reason for that was how I got to the Frankfurt School in the first place. I encountered it in the prison of war camp in Norfolk, where the Frankfurt School, together with the new school, had influenced Mrs. Roosevelt the, in those terms that people thought that all Germans were Nazis or that all Italians were Nazis that therefore also the 300,000 German prisoners here and the 100,000 Italian prisoners were also all Nazis. And they convinced Mrs. Roosevelt that there may be some anti-Nazis among them. And so then a new policy was established so that the prisoners were investigated uh, who of them were Nazis, who were anti-Nazis and who were war criminals. And I had to go through this investigation too. And since I had been a leader in the Catholic youth movement in Frankfurt, and we had spread the letters of Graf von Gaal and Bishop of Münster against the concentration camps, and we had helped Jewish people. And so I was categorized as an anti-Nazi and then was trained in ideas which came from the uh, later Frankfurt School, the critical theory of uh, society. And so uh, that was the first contact. But my real contact with the Frankfurt School came after I came home to Germany, when through two of my friends, um, Walter Dirks and Eugen Kogon, I came in contact then with Adorno and Horkheimer. 
and um, the uh, the both Adorno and Walter Dirks had been friends already between the wars. They joined their interest in music together and played together, and also were interested in their religious uh, thinking. And in spite of the fact that uh, Walter Dirks was a devoted Catholic, a student of the great uh, Romano Guardini, he had the best friendship with Adorno, who said, I cannot believe. And in spite of the fact that Adorno said, non credo, I cannot believe, and Walter Dirk said, I believe, these two were wonderful friends. And so I came from this religious side to the uh, Frankfurt School. And so for me, it was obvious that Horkheimer's idea of the longing for the totally other was not only an event of his late life or so, but that from the very beginning he had been educated in a Jewish family in Stuttgart. And um, so her, his mother read continually Psalm 91 in the You Eternal One Alone, I Trust. And that is what got her through the Nazi time until finally uh, a Catholic taxi driver took her and her husband to Switzerland where they were rescued. So, and it is this psalm then which uh, the first verse, which then Horkheimer used to put on his parents' grave in Zurich, uh, the Jewish cemetery. And then uh, the second part of the first verse he put on his own gravestone in you eternal uh, in you uh, eternal one i alone alone i trust and so therefore there was always this jewish background and he um, Horkheimer went to the synagogue but even marcuse who was the most secular of all of them he also still went to the synagogue in new york and gave talks and so on so Somehow they kept their religiosity somehow in the background, like they also, their relationship to Marx, they put into the background a little bit too, uh, because they wanted, when they came to the States particularly, they wanted to be friends with people. And so they de-emphasized whatever uh, may be in the way. So Eric Fromm had this uh, revolutionary personality and when he came to the States, because of the States were so conservative, he then called it the democratic personality in opposition to the uh, authoritarian personality. <clears throat> so therefore, uh, I think um, the riddle which uh, Gregory had to the end of his life, why I was so friendly, toward the Frankfurt School and others were so critical. Even my revolutionary students, who were also students of the Frankfurt School, partially, partially students of Bakunin, the anarchists. Many of them were not Marx, but were Bakuninists. But nevertheless, even they were critical of the Frankfurt School because they thought they were not revolutionary enough. And um, other criticism was that they were too theoretical, that they were too abstract. Um, but if when they were not revolutionary enough, there was a reason for that, because there was the uh, German, um, the, the German uh, Democratic uh, Republic was right beside the German Federal Republic. And uh, it could be that a weakening of the Federal Republic would take, uh, maybe would mean that the uh, Eastern part would penetrate the Western part. So they were somehow afraid that, uh, that such a revolution in West Germany would make East Germany stronger and East Germany could maybe uh, enter West Germany. And so th that was the reason. But uh, so it even came so far that Adorno had to call the police against his own students in order to rescue his institute in Frankfurt. So, so, so therefore, the um, issue, the uh, problem which Gregory 
had with my friendliness that I applied somehow the Frankfurt School's own theory, uh, own method to the Frankfurt School, namely determinate negation, that I uh, was critical of some of what they did. But on the other hand, I also tried to rescue as much of it as possible. And that was general <laughs> the attitude which I had. <clears throat> so that about our issue with the uh, Frankfurt School, but the Blondel orientation, which Gregory took, was something which brought him closer to uh, Hegel, but unfortunately he did not study Hegel at all. And so that was a difficulty in, in his whole approach. While Adorno, for instance, was very much influenced by Hegel, and Jürgen Habermas today also is very much imitates Hegel's whole system in a new way. <clears throat> so, and uh, it remains very important. One cannot understand the Hegelian right or the Hegelian left or the Hegelian center without <laughs> Hegel himself and without seeing what happened among his students, why they could not hold together what he could still hold together. Yeah, and, and a few years back um, in 2020, we published your Feshrift, uh, The Critique of Religion and Religion's Critique, thinking that was the dialectical method of religion, um, you know, that it is a source of critique of society and also society, uh, philosophy, secularity is also critique of religion. Um, and in that Feshrift, uh, published by Brill in 2020 and, and Haymarket Books in 2021, uh, Gregory wrote what he called a, a love letter to Rudy, a love letter to you. Um, and, and obviously in the book today, it's called Laudato Si, um, with a footnote that uh, he had originally called it a love letter to Rudy. Um, and it reminded me that it, when I got this in my correspondence with him, that uh, he, he passed away soon after that. Uh, well, he before it was uh, published, he passed away, uh, but it very well could have been the the last thing that he he published. Um, but I guess my I want to answer this quick question more biographically. When when was the last time you saw um, Gregory Gregory or were, were with him? Uh, so the last time it was maybe a year before his death. We met in Notre, at Notre Dame there, um, and uh, so I had my friends with me. Uh, Karen and Ken, and um, he invited us for lunch there, and he even paid for it, which had never happened before. And um, so uh, he was there, and he said, "Well, they invited me. I'm because I'm old, and uh, so they are merciful, and so on." But he had always tried to um, build a bridge between me and Notre Dame. When I um, came to, to Baltimore, I taught with the Jesuits there for three years. And then the Jesuits thought I would be the right man to go to Western Michigan University in their religion department because they wanted to build a theology department here. And so they had a Jewish theologian, Catholic theologian and so on. And that was an unbelievable type the thing it never happened and uh, theology departments are not allowed in Catholic, in uh, state universities so um, that was uh, uh, so I then uh, came to to Western and uh, through through the mediation of um, uh, the Jesuits and the one Jesuit who was my predecessor here John Harden was a very extreme right-wing uh, uh, theologian who worked together with the uh, uh, Inquisitor in Rome um, and uh, on the Catechism particularly. But um, the first time that I uh, um, was in contact with this extremely conservative uh, Catholicism here. So, and um, so we had uh, 
the problem then, who would help me when I would go out into the wilderness? And so the issue was that Notre Dame would be the only sound uh, island of uh, faith in the Midwest, and they were supposed to give me help, but no help came, and uh, because they were too far to the right as well, and so we did not really fit. So even now, while the governor of Michigan recognized my work, the bishop of the diocese did not. So deep does this right and left Catholicism go at this moment. <clears throat> you know, I remember so many years back when Hans Kuhn um, was, said something like the Catholic Church needs an Obama. It was still under Pope Benedict XVI, and he thought they needed Obama. They needed someone with that kind of open-mindedness, open to the world, charisma, maybe, something like this. Something yeah, that could... We can do it. We can do it. Yeah, this... Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Very positive. Someone who could rescue the church. Obviously, that's that right. when his book came out, Can the Church Be Rescued? Um, and then in 2013, Jorge Bergoglio is elected Pope Francis I. And I wonder, I wonder if 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 the papacy of Pope Francis the first is more would have been more of a home for Gregory than than the much more conservative church. Do you, did you ever talk to him about Francis, or 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 can you surmise what he would have thought about uh, Francis? Yeah. No, we did not uh, talk about him, but. Uh, I think he uh, he would have been very happy for this development. So we have to see what the core problem is in this whole thing. The core problem, you could almost say, is a methodological one. And it is that, that the church, against its own tradition, did not determine to negate modernity. And so the uh, total negation of modernity came to its climax in the... Uh, uh, with the German Pope, and uh, afterwards, now Francis tried to balance this again and uh, make it determinate negation. Also, Francis is critical, of course, of certain aspects of modernity, but at the same time, he is willing, as the church always was, to see if there was not something good on the other side, <clears throat> which one could, uh, which one, which was worthwhile to be rescued. And that is what is new with Francis, and that is what uh, produces the present conflict. I think if we can get this methodological issue clear, then uh, I think we can get out of the crisis. Yeah, as we're coming to our our end here, like one one big question for you. What do you think is the ultimate legacy of Gregory Baum in his his theology and his sociology and his ecumenicism, even in, in his humanity? Uh, was it simply Nostra Aetate? Because that's what I hear constantly when you bring up Gregory Baum. Oh, he was a part of a Nostra Aetate in Vatican II. Or is it something bigger than just Nostra Aetate? Well, he was an unbelievably open type of a person. So you could say an unbelievably uh, inclusive type dem of democratic type of a personality and opposed as much as thinkable to the authoritarian personality and to the authoritarian church. So the church had been democratic and uh, and uh, somehow even communistic in the beginning, and then became slowly more and more uh, monotheistic, more and more aristocratic, and the democratic element was completely pushed into the background. And I think Gregory's legacy is that this democratic element should find its place as well in the church again, and it does that now in this solidarity movement, particularly in Germany and in France. And so I think his strength was in this direction. And uh, his whole, what he wrote, 
uh, can help uh, the critical Catholics to um, have a stronger position in uh, what is what is coming. So no matter what the Pope will decide, if he will decide for the conservatives, then the uh, progressive people will split off. If he decides for the progressive people, the regressive people will uh, will be excommunicated and so on. So this is a very dangerous type of development. And in this, uh, Gregory's teaching, his attitude, his panentheism can really be helpful. He is as open as anybody can possibly be open. And at the same time, remaining faithful to whatever truth there is in the Christian tradition. So I would say that this is his uh, heritage for all of us. Yeah, indeed, indeed, absolutely. Well, Dr. Siebert, it's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope our listeners are now uh, inspired to go and pick up some of Gregory's works, some of his writings, his essays. They're abundant. <laughs> to say the least, and uh, to get into the, to, to know the work and the, the person of Gregory Obama, an absolute amazing human being. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Siebert. You're welcome.